Like many foreigners, I'm often asked uh, what got me interested in Japan in the first place. And it's, it's difficult to pin it down to any one thing. Uh, growing up in Australia, the 1970s, the 1980s, Japanese influence was huge. I do remember uh, when I was a kid, uh, we, were, we were living in Queensland, um, in one relatively small town, and then moved to an even smaller town because my parents were high school teachers. And so this was 1978, uh, yes, 1978, my dad bought a Mazda uh, made in Hiroshima. And I remember it had Yokohama tires on it. And the, both of those names caught my interest. And I used to wash the car for dad. So I used to see all the time the name Yokohama and thought, wouldn't mind going to Yokohama one day. And we moved to this particularly small town. And I remember the very first day I was at school, they divided us into two teams to play football and their simple way of dividing up the kids to play footy was Fords against Holdens. That was the simple division rule. Uh, Holdens were General Motors cars because in a small town in Queensland in the late 1970s pretty much everyone drove a Ford or a Holden. And I said well, my dad drives a Mazda, and most kids didn't even really know what that was. Within a few years, of, of course, Japanese cars were coming to predominate in the Australian market. And we have seen now that all manufacturers are pulled out of Australia, and it's all, it's all foreign cars. Well, of course, one of the reasons why the Japanese car industry became so uh, influential globally was because of its relatively low cost. It's high quality, very high quality for its cost. And uh, it got to the point where actually in the mining industry, for example, in Australia, um, the only vehicle that's used typically is a Toyota Land Cruiser. And so that's become very much the iconic vehicle within the, uh, the mining industry. So if you go to the very remote parts of Australia, uh, of course, it's Toyota. And over time, Toyota was incredibly successful at this. Toyota was able to communicate a clear message to Australian consumers especially those living in remote parts of the country, precisely because you have to go so far, precisely because reliability matters so much to you, you have to buy a Toyota. Now, how did they get to such a high level of, of mastery of quality? Well, the production process innovations we've talked about, or I've talked about in a previous video that you can see, um, and at the same time, keeping costs under control, because certainly you can make very high quality products, uh, for example, uh, Swiss handmade watches that are very expensive to the point of being exclusive and uh, high status precisely because they are so expensive that the price is exclusive. It was innovation such as just in time production, being able to manage your supply chain effectively so that uh, you could uh, reduce your inventory costs, and you can see the in the, uh, the slide set that I talk further about the logic of this, that if you don't have too much of your inventory on hand, you can reduce warehousing costs, for example. Also, there's a quality advantage here, that if things are being brought just in time from suppliers, and then you discover that there is a quality problem with components, Rather than having three months stock of them in the warehouse, you have three days stock of them, maybe one day stock of them, and you can very quickly alert the suppliers to the fact that there has been a manufacturing defect, for example. So some of the things uh, unique to the Japanese context, which made this innovation uh, in manufacturing processes possible, desirable, uh, some of these factors in Japan are just fortuitous. The relatively high cost of land, uh, the relatively compact nature of Japan, these things added up to a viable model where suppliers could produce uh, inputs into the manufacturing process, deliver them not long before they're needed, not too far away, and through very reliable transport systems. In countries with m much greater distances, that in some respects is more difficult to do. Of course, the flip side though, of course, is um, much more land um, storage and whatnot. So therefore, less of an imperative to do just-in-time delivery in the first place. So certain features about Japan added up to a production model, which uh, helped to develop quality and also to, uh, to reduce costs, to reduce waste. So that is a significant factor 
in the growing international competitiveness of the car industry. But of course there are so many other fields of manufacturing in Japan beyond cars too, where Japan really grew its reputation. And for me, when people really push me to say, what really made you fall in love with Japan? Because, you know, when I was at that school in a little town called Serena in central Queensland, um, being of the Mazda club at school made me in a club of one. That was a bit of a lonely place to be. Um, my dad, um, in addition to being a school teacher, like my mum, was also a photographer. And uh, eventually he quit being a school teacher and had his own photography studio. And every house we had, even while he was school, so, uh, still a school teacher, um, had a dark room. So I grew up uh, helping my dad develop black and white photos um, from as young as I can remember. And I have here in my office um, some of the Nikon lenses that your dad used to use. Uh, some of these date back to the, uh, the 1960s. And um, you can't, I can't show you my latest Nikon, the Z50, because I'm talking to it right now. But I can put this on that Nikon um, and I can take beautiful pictures with this thing. This thing is as beautiful and reliable as the day it was made. It's just a, uh, a true work of art and lots of people collect these, although there's so many of them around that doesn't actually cost that much to collect them, but people who really love precision optics are just in awe of these products. And well, I've got a heap of them. Um, I dug around and found these before. These are my filters that I had from when I was taking pictures as a kid. And um, I used a couple of different cameras, but uh, from my early 20s I used all, all Nikons. I used some other things. And this is one that I've had for decades. Still works. Um, these are the filters that I, I used, and if we look at the brands, um, Izuma, made in Japan, Kenko, made in Japan, Hoya, made in Japan, another Hoya, Photo Tape. Um, all of these are made in Japan. Every lens that uh, I ever gave consideration to buying over the years, uh, and anyone I know doing photography gave consideration to, was made in Japan. Um, Zeiss lens, Carl Zeiss out of Germany. Uh, they were the only non-Japanese product around, very boutique, artisan, or very storied, very expensive. The vast majority of people didn't think about them. Um, this lens is kind of interesting, and uh, for the very simple reason that this became the stock standard pr um, press photographer's lens, along with um, one of these and one of these, that every photographer had. They could throw them around, um, they could get bashed, uh, they would work perfectly, and they were incredibly clean, beautiful lenses. And it was always said about people with this lens, if you couldn't take a clear photograph with this, you uh, couldn't take a photograph with anything. Finally, the resilience of these things and why Nikon became the only thing that pros would use. Um, you can't see it here, but this has got a big dent in here. Um, I was riding on the uh, back of a motorbike in Thailand when I was 19 years old and it came off my shoulder and bounced off the road um, at relatively high speed. Picked it up and it still worked. Okay, so this for me is one of the things that made me fall in love with Japan. These wonderful quality things that really speak to the, uh, the spirit of monozukuri. And so many other people fell in love with Japan from different fields, but for similar kinds of reasons. Um, chefs love global knives, for example. Uh, so many different people in different fields. It's still a natural thing to do just to buy Japanese because they associate that with uh, quality and innovation. Japan's challenge uh, is, though, to take its great technologies, um, its great components, its history of monozukuri, and to respond to emerging product segments. And unfortunately, that's where Japan's been a bit slower um, in the last couple of decades. I've been a bit sad to see, quite honestly, that segments such as in photography, the gimbal, the stabilizers you use for cameras, um, Japanese firms just aren't there. Drones, Japanese firms aren't there. Um, small rideables, uh, 
motorized skateboards, as it were, kick, you know, kickboards, um, electric bikes, all of these kind of things. Japan is the world's best manufacturer of small motors, of sensors, of optical equipment and whatnot. In all of those areas, Japan should absolutely predominate. But it seems many Japanese firms got locked into existing product categories and missed the opportunity to see entirely new products, entirely new market spaces, niches um, emerging. So often Japanese firms still benefit as suppliers of components, but to some degree they've missed out on new market opportunities there. Finally, uh, companies such as Nikon have done extraordinarily well in terms of incremental innovation. But this big, game-changing, uh, deep design-driven reimagining of customer experiences, customer needs, to create entirely new product segments, such as we saw Apple do with the smartphone. Unfortunately, Japan hasn't shown much pizzazz in that respect. Um, but uh, I hold out hope because if you've got such a legacy of quality, of technology, and you've got such good social infrastructure, you've got good transport systems and whatnot, then there are still really the foundations for innovation, for dynamism into the future. I'm hopeful.